Hi, everybody, and welcome back to my Zero Carb Life. I am Kelly Hogan, and I am joined today by Benet Kennington, who is a therapist. Now, Benet, I'm so excited to have you here, but I want to tell people how this came to be. <laughs> this just happened yesterday, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yesterday, I was on Instagram, sitting on my front porch, just while I was telling about a weird dream I had, for starters. <laughs> That was really odd. Yes. Yeah. But then but then I started talking about this book that I'm reading, which is called Grit. And I'm only through the first couple of chapters, but I was talking about how I really hope it will help with coaching people because so often people have all the information that they need. Like you know exactly what you need to do. People even tell me I know exactly what I need to do to improve my health. And here's why I need to do it. And here's what I see for myself in the future. And I'm like, yes, yes. And then some people at the end of the month, they have thrived. They have met every goal. They've stayed true to themselves. They've done it. They're feeling changes. And they're like, this has been life changing. And then others are like, you know, I ended up giving back into cookies again. And you're like, what happened? What? But you knew what you wanted. And, you know, there's, so there's this element that I really want to help understand of, grit, having a passion and a perseverance for something. So while I was talking about this book, you apparently, you watched the Instagram story and then you sent me a message and you had said that you were a counselor, therapist, and that you had gone down your own rabbit hole of reading books. And you told me to Google the concept of cognitive diffusion with acceptance and commitment therapy. I was like, wow. Okay. That's a lot to remember. <laughs> and I found why well, remember all that when I could just have you on here to explain it all for me? So, Benet, thank you so much for coming. I would love to know what got you interested in these theories and how you think it could apply to help people in carnivore. Okay, so I've been a therapist for about 30 years, and um, the majority of my therapy has been with adolescents who are going through the foster care system. So a lot of the therapy I've been doing has been more crisis mode, kind of maintaining adolescence and stuff like that. So I kind of got out of the more recent therapeutic modes that are out there. And so when I went back to counseling one-on-one -on -one, um, with families, individuals, couples, um, I went back to, of course, my foundational therapeutic model, which is CBT, that's cognitive behavioral therapy, which can be life-changing and it also can help with weight loss. It, it's just, it's changing your thought patterns. But then when I came back into counseling one-on-one um, -on -one with people, I learned about ACT. That is ACT, that is an acronym and it stands for acceptance and commitment therapy. The goal is to teach psychological flexibility in that you are able to accept whatever your life is holding, whatever you're thinking or feeling at that moment in the present moment, be able to accept that and continue to live a value-based life that brings you meaning and purpose. So where it helps the acceptance, and the acceptance doesn't mean you're okay with how you're feeling or you agree with what you're thinking, okay. but it is an acceptance that this is how it is right now. And that's okay because I can learn how to navigate and maneuver around these things that I may find unpleasant right now so I can continue to move towards my values that I have identified in life. There are six different pillars that they all work together, but one of the pillars is cognitive diffusion. So that means to not fuse with the thoughts you're having because we all, or most of us, pretty typically assume we have a thought, oh, that must be true. We really don't evaluate that thought. We just assume that's true because why would I have had that thought if it weren't true? So then our feelings and our behaviors line up with that thought, whatever it is. So if I'm going down the road, because my middle name should be French fry, I'm like a French fry. 
and it's like, oh, okay. So then it gets in my head and I yeah. start thinking about those French fries and I remember how good those French fries are. So then I start craving, I want some French fries. Well, I'm just going to get these French fries today and then I'll go back on, you know, eating the way that I want to eat in a healthy way, following all the rules tomorrow. Well, you've already gone down that rabbit hole. Yeah. So cognitive diffusion, it is strategies that you can use so you do not fuse with that thought. What we do is typically we look from our thoughts as if these thoughts are part of us. We've internalized these thoughts. It's coming from within us. So we look from our thoughts. What we should do is look at our thoughts to externalize them, put some distance between ourselves and that thought. And one method called labeling, all you do is like back to the example of the French fries. Yes. So I'm having a thought and that, oh, I want those French fries. Well, so all you do is you put in the front of that sentence, oh, I notice I'm having a thought that I want some French fries. I know this sounds so minuscule and it's like, what? But now you are looking at it as it's just a mental event. It's not internalized. It's not coming from within. Thoughts come and go like the tide comes and goes. Yeah. Feelings come and go just like the tide come and comes and goes. And so you're looking at that thought by just simply saying, oh, I'm having a thought that I want a French fry. But that's just a thought. So yeah. it doesn't mean I really want it. It just popped up there. And you can take it one step further and visualize if you're a visual type person that that thought's in a cloud and the, soon it's going to go away and another cloud will come and, and it's going to go away. And there's nothing you really even have to do about it. You don't have to act on it because you had that thought. It was just a random thought. Another technique is um, leaves on a stream where whatever thought that you're having, you can just visualize or, you know, just to yourself, put that thought on a leaf and just let it go on down the stream. You don't have to act on that thought because okay. there's really no truth to that thought. It's just, again, another mental event that happens, but it's that separation. So you don't fuse with that thought that keeps you or can help you um, keep you from acting on that thought because what we do when a thought comes we automatically are entertaining it we don't just accept it as it's a thought and let it go we automatically feel like we have to entertain it so then we start struggling with it because if it's something like this is not on my diet. I do not need to be eating these French fries. I know I shouldn't be eating these French fries. So then you get into a struggle yeah. against your own self and, and get all tangled up and you just get lost in that versus just accepting. I have that thought, but it means nothing. Right. And just let it go. Also, people try to repress thoughts. I, I'm not thinking about that French fry. I'm not thinking about that French fry. <laughs> the more you try not to think of something, you're right. That is that is how fasting works for me. The more I make a big deal about, I am not going to eat for 24 yes. hours, then it's like, I can't even make it my usual 16 hours because now I'm suddenly thinking of nothing but that clock. It doesn't work that way for everybody, but that's yeah. how fasting is for me. It's like that pink elephant. Once you've told me not to think about it, oh, I'm thinking about You're it. You're thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm a carny baby. I'm only just going into what I think is like day 32, but okay. there has never been a time in my life that I've been able to stick with anything longer than a week. Ever. I'm telling you, ever. I'm 54. Ever. <laughs> and I have used this simple technique and it has literally, it's just like, it has no power anymore. It's just, I just use that technique and send it to a cloud and then yeah. I'm on about my day. So um, 
I don't know if that, if it's so effective for me because I know the entire model and all the other pieces like the value-based living because that plays a role. Tell um, me about that. What does that mean? So, so part of it is you have your value-based living and your committed action. Okay. Your committed action are your goals that you set out for your life, whatever it is, whether they're health goals, family goals, relationship goals, career goals, whatever those are. But those goals, you don't just set right out for those goals. You have to define your values first. Values are those things that give you meaning and purpose in life. Those things that matter to you. So then the goals that you develop are going to directly go to each of those values that you have for yourself. So that plays into it. So if I'm using one of these strategies and I'm understanding that, hey, I'm accepting these thoughts are here. I'm not going to, you know, do tug of war with them. I'm not going to act like they're not here. They're here. That's fine. That doesn't mean I don't want to continue eating this way. That doesn't mean I have to go get French fries. It's just a thought. So, um, and then mindfulness comes in into play. That's another principle in this model. And um, so mindfulness is just being present in the moment, in the here and the now, because the power is in the now. The power is not in the past. You can't do anything about that. The power is not in the future because the future is not here, even if it's 10 minutes from now. The power is in the here and now. And so to just be fully present in this moment and to, and then that just talks about using all of your senses to, you know, I see that, you know, you can describe something. Uh, how does it smell? How does it look? How does it feel? These are um, called like grounding techniques. Is that right? Like yes. how to sort of ground yourself into the exact moments. What do you smell, see, taste? To bring exactly. you to right here. That reminds me of Jessica Reynolds. She goes by Coach Jessica. I was listening to her on Against the Grain podcast the other day, and she was talking about how fear in all of her coaching of people, she sees that fear is what po- holds people back the most. So people will say what they want. They will say, I want to live a long life. I want to be healthy. I want to lose 50 pounds. I want, want, want. And then when she gets into conversations with them, then she can hear that there's actually fears about that because changing is scary. I mean, even if it's exciting, changing is scary. So she can hear them saying, yeah, but I do worry about loose skin. I hear that a lot, right? I want to lose 50 pounds, but I do worry about loose skin. And then none of my clothes are going to fit. And I don't know, am I even going to feel like the same person? So she says that there are actually fears there. And what made me think of that is they're not in the moment. They are thinking so far ahead of this moment. They're way in the future, anticipating what could be problems with this. People write to me and say, did you ever worry that you were going to look old after you lost weight? I was like, I was not worried about looking old. I had boils and was obese. I really just wanted to feel good. Yeah. I think those fears, what they think is coming in the future can hold them back. And also definitely, because what that is, is anxiety. Anxiety is nothing but fear of the future. And so anxiety is such a real thing. And so for her to say she hears a lot of this, this fear talk, um, I mean, that is something that they're going to have to be able to manage um, in order to continue to go through it. But that's the best way to manage any kind of anxious feelings that you're having is to actually expose yourself and just keep going through it because people want to back up and avoid and that actually makes it grow bigger. Also, when you were talking about what you value and your purpose on this earth, it reminded me of what she said too. She said, do you have a purpose by spending all of our waking time? This is not a direct quote. I was just typing as she was talking, by the way. Yeah. Um, By spending all of our waking time thinking about food or self-loathing on how bad we look or then binging and purging and trying how we look in an outfit, focusing on, oh gosh, I went out in this outfit and it's too snug. Everybody's looking at me. Like we are missing out on whatever our true purpose is. 
and we're making everything in the room feel like it's all about us. Everyone's looking mm-hmm. at us. And even though we feel like we're self-loathing, it's actually a very self-centered, selfish uh-huh. type of approach. Laura Spath on the podcast had mentioned that actually sounds very selfish. And whereas mm-hmm. the person having those feelings is like, I'm not selfish. I don't even like myself, right? But you're making it all about yourself. So what Jessica was saying is, what is our purpose until you have something that you feel like you are here to do? And she eventually determined she was here to help other people. She was here to coach. She was here to lead people through these thoughts and to get out to do those things. She has to leave her house, <laughs> you know, that <laughs> gave her yeah. some purpose. Do you, mm-hmm. do you feel like that? pretty important step in recovery from anything that's where I start with all of my clients is you know let's look at and a lot of people they're not even sure what their values are and so I mean you really have to start from square one because a lot of people and but it's just because I I'm a counselor. So of course I'm seeing people who have had traumas and and things like that they don't even know their value um, as a person. And so it never even occurs to them. Do I have any control at all over how I want my life to look and what matters to me? Because this never mattered to anybody when I was growing up. You know, a lot of people, they feel like they don't have a purpose. Well, yeah, just for one, you have a creator and he created you for a purpose. So you do have a purpose. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> so. Yeah. I was reflecting again on what coach Jessica had said that one indicator of what your purpose is. And you just alluded to this is what gets you excited when something throughout the day. And I do think there are people out there who are so sick, mm-hmm. still addicted to either heavier substances or even just carbohydrates on blood yeah. sugar highs that they honestly haven't felt excited in a long time. But, you know, if you were to really think back, like for me, obviously talking about health and carnivore and meat and how it changed my life, I get excited. I get excited talking about music. I'm a music teacher. I get excited talking about God. I get, there's so many things in my life where I'm like, yes, these are my passions. These are my purposes in life. But do you ever meet people who literally can't think of anything? Yeah. And and like I said, it has a lot to do with traumas that they've experienced in in their life. And it could have been 30 years ago. Um, Or it it could have been someone who started on the road towards what they felt like their purpose was, but they kept meeting obstacles. So then they started questioning themselves, doubting themselves, not feeling like, um, well, maybe this isn't my purpose. Maybe this isn't what I supposed to do, even though I really enjoy it and it excites me. So, so it's not always an easy path, even though you have that passion for something, you still have to put your work in. Yeah. If you really want to get rid of that. Yep. (laughs) There's the grit. Yep. If you really want to get rid of that autoimmune disorder, If you really want to lose 50 to 100 pounds, if you really want to become more active and work out with weights or jog or walk or whatever it is, you're going to have to do the work. I mean, let's be real. You've got to do the work. And so, and that's where these thought strategies come in. And, you know, now I can go back to um, my first love, cognitive behavioral therapy, where when these thoughts come up, we have a feeling um, and we typically recognize that before our thought. But there's a trigger, there's a situation, there's a memory, there's some kind of event, something that happened. It is your interpretation of that. And then you start feeling a certain way. And so if you can take that thought and replace it with a more rational thought because typically it's going to be a cognitive distortion. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Let's say with that French fry example, let's say I went ahead and I gave into it and went and got me some French fries. Well, so now I'm stuck there after the fact and I have a cognitive distortion of, well, I blind it for the day. I might as well just go ahead and blow it for the rest of, you know, the day. Yeah. And then you wake spiral. up the next morning. People yeah, spiral. you wake up the next morning and you think, oh, I can't believe I did that. And you get entangled up in that thought. And then it's like, 
well, I've blown it for the week. I might as well just, you know, start next Monday. And so it just gets out of control. Um, there's numerous cognitive distortions that we use. There's overgeneralizations. There's mind reading. Um, it, would that be like saying, I'm a quitter. I never do that. I never yes. stick to it. I hear people do that in, in coaching sessions. They'll be like, well, it's not surprising because this is what I always do. It's like, oh. And right. I, I don't know enough about the actual terms to label what they're doing, but I'm hearing you say that. I'm like, yeah, that's what that is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cognitive distortion. It's, it's not, it's not, I'm going to go back to cognitive diffusion though, yes. because there are certain circumstances that things are so internalized in us. And what you just said, that thought right there tells me that those people they have internalized that and they have labeled themselves as that. This is me. This is what I do. And they are tangled up. They have fused with those thoughts of themselves. And so therefore, pretty much behaviorally, even though they don't want to, they're going to follow through with that kind of thinking. And How can so, we fix it? I want to fix it. What can that, we do? That's what I'm telling you. Yeah, How tell me. Just... Just if people would tr really try this, it's such a weird okay. concept, but to put it outside of yourself and to really see it as one, there's no truth to that. True, maybe that has happened, but that's only because behaviorally you did it. That doesn't mean that's who you are. You are not okay. defined by your thoughts. You are not defined by your emotions. So let's put it off. Let's look at the thought instead of it being part of us. And uh, I noticed in the past quite a bit, I have always gone back to eating the way I was yeah. doing it before. Well, doesn't mean it's going to happen again. Doesn't even mean if I'm having that thought that I want to go back to the way I was eating. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a thought. So I started that July 1st, and I will tell you, no physical cravings at all, ever. I mean, yeah. I started July 1st, and they were immediately gone. I had none. And I'm telling you, I am bread, pasta, um, potato girl. And I had none. It took care of it just like that. So that was a great yes. thing. But then I was still left with, okay, thoughts of French fries and stuff yeah. like that. And I was like, okay. I'm going to try cognitive diffusion, just like I do with my walking and everything. And I'm telling you every time, like clockwork, it's like, it just rolls on past. And I don't think it. it's so powerful. Well, here's one reason I thought you would be the perfect person to talk to. It is because you're a new carnivore. I talk to my new carnivores all the time and say, I tell them, please journal, write this down because what you are going through, you can use that to help somebody else because it's hard for most everybody who starts, you know, you're going to have to break. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Huge change. So I want to hear from you because you've just gone through it. You're like right in what for some people is a very difficult spot, but I think you have made a really good point in the past. This may not have worked for you, but I think you've done two things. You have combined your therapy ideas, your cognitive labeling and diffusion and all that you already knew but now you've got this additional thing in your corner and it is the fact that you don't constantly have addictive foods coming into your body because there's this physical thing it's like so one, easy yes. oh my gosh I would not like, believe it <laughs> it'd be like blaming an alcoholic for continuing to be an alcoholic when society forces them to have a drink every day and yeah. they don't know any different right like right. we were always I was always a dieter, but I didn't know that the very diet foods that I was eating was part of the addiction. I so, know. Yes. So now yes. that you've broken this physical part, like, you know, okay, it's carbs. Now you have, people have a fighting chance. You can label a thought and let it fly by, right? Like yes. it's not the same as my entire cellular being is screaming for a Snickers. It's like, right. oh, I did like Snickers. Okay. So I like Snickers. Label that sucker. Get on out of here. And I think <laughs> yeah. it's also important to note that these thoughts, 
you describe them as waves. And I always say that in coaching too, because sometimes those waves come hard and it will knock people down. They're like, I've yeah. got to have ice cream now. And I'll tell them, get on Facebook because we've got groups, you know, where we message yeah. each other. I yeah. say, talk it out right now. You can talk it out, but just know, and sometimes it helps to just have somebody remind you of this. That is a wave. And what do waves do? They come and they go. You will not be like, boom, slammed constantly. It'll go. That's right. And, you know, so in the field of act, they call it having a Teflon mind that things okay. don't stick. Yeah. So when these thoughts come, you have to just let them slide off of you. Expect them to come. And if okay. you want to be really radical, we talk about radical acceptance. Yeah. That doesn't mean you like it, you agree with it, but invite the thoughts on in. Hey, come on, thought. I'm not scared of you. You have no power over me. You're just a thought. You're okay. there's no truth to you. You're just a thought. So you want to come on in, but if you're walking around anxious, feeling like, oh my gosh, you know, am I going to be able to make it through this day? You're yeah. already setting yourself up for failure because you're yeah. already questioning yourself. So when you were talking before about accepting a thought, sometimes I'll have a thought, let's say right before I go on to do a group chat or a, or a YouTube video, perhaps I might have a thought, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. I can't do this. You're saying that I could just accept the fact I do feel nervous. But that doesn't mean I can do this. So I feel nervous. I feel yeah, nervous. Yeah. And you, you just accept it and you just don't fuse with it. It's okay. But I think sometimes people will take that thought of, I'm nervous. I can't do this. I'm nervous. I can't do this. And they ball it into one thing and they sit with it and play it as a tape in their mind. And so the truth of, I'm nervous gets fused with the truth of, I can't do this. And now suddenly you're locked, right? right. You can't do this. Right. But to just say, I do feel nervous, but then to think, but what's actually happening? What's happening right now? Yes, it's a YouTube video, but I am sitting in a brown chair <laughs> talking to my grounding, right? Yes. Your grounding techniques. I'm sitting in a brown chair. It feels, you know, soft. If it has a smell to it, you know, <laughs> just grounding yourself in that yeah. moment to kind of calm yourself. Right. But yeah. And so, so, so I'll tell you this Chick fil A, love me some Chick fil A. Um, once a week, all my life, I've gone to Chick-fil-A. Right. So the thought is Chick-fil-A mm -hmm. sandwiches are good. I used to enjoy them. I, I, I know that that is true, but also I did not enjoy. And then there are so many other things about my life that were not enjoyable during that time. And so right. you, you lay it out in front of you and, you know, you look at the evidence as to why, you know, it made me feel really bad. Yeah. Made me put on a lot of weight. It inflamed my, yeah. you know, autoimmune disorder. So that yeah. is going back to the cognitive distortions. And then you would replace it with the evidence that, oh, I'm feeling a lot better, that kind of stuff. Yes. So that's just to show you that's another tool. And so in that case, you might say Chick-fil-A sandwiches were very good and I did enjoy them. But I really enjoy being the size now and feeling good now and not having boils. You know what else tastes really good? Bacon. And right. that actually <laughs> makes me feel good. So one of the things that I've started to do with people is to say, you know, when you are needing comfort, name some comfort foods. Well, you know what people say. It's always like macaroni and cheese, oh, chicken, yeah. and, chicken and dumplings, grilled cheese sandwich. And it's like, okay, because we've been trained. These are comfort foods. When we're little, your mom would be like, oh, you don't feel good. Here, have this. It's associated with comfort. And so yeah. we just also need to retrain oh, what yeah. is comfort. I said, because really, a thick, juicy ribeye with a nice crust on it and a big pat of butter in the center, that could be your redefined comfort yeah. food. Or a big plate of just crunchy bacon comfort food but until you start to accept that because there will be times when we feel like we need comfort and of course we should go to non-food sources a friend a hug prayer a walk you know real comfort mm -hmm. but yeah. <laughs> we often yeah. want quick quick edible yeah. comfort but you know you can train yourself to think of chicken wings as a comfort food oh <laughs> yeah that's a, hungry now yeah, right? <laughs> if people find themselves fighting against their thoughts and they can't let it go just know that you only have to deal with it in that moment. 
you don't have yeah. to deal with 30 minutes. You don't have right. to deal with an hour or tomorrow or next week yeah. or next month or next year or forever. It's yeah. just like now in the moment, because in the moment is where the power is. Yes. New carnivores will say to me, I don't think I can do that forever. I'm like, what could we ever do forever? If you were to ask <laughs> right. me, can you be a music teacher forever? Gosh, no. But I've done it now 21 years. I mean, right. <laughs> because right. you do it one day at a time. But if you had asked me on day two, when I was yeah. exhausted and struggling, are you going to be able to do this for 30 years? No way. Right. And right. I still don't know if I'll make it to 30 years, but I don't have to. I just right. have to do it today. Yeah. Can you do today? Yes. Right. Yes. And then figure out tomorrow then. And that's how I feel also about this whole meat thing. You don't have to say, I'm going to only eat meat forever. Just literally, could you eat meat today? Yes. Right. Well, then tomorrow will automatically be easier because you're going to have that physical part further behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I wanted you here because you've been breaking addiction yourself. You've dealt with clients while helping them to get through hard times because you were interested on the topic of grit also. And we're both sort of on this mindset of how can we help new carnivores to get through these waves how can we help them get these thoughts out of their heads for a minute and not accept it as like, this is who I am. I am a French fry eater. I am a quitter. No, you're not. That's just maybe the decisions you've made in the past and going forward, you can choose every single thing that goes in your mouth. You can choose who you want to be. You can break with those old thoughts. You can have grit. You can persevere and get passionate. People can change. And I'm thankful that you gave them some new tools to hopefully do that. Thank you, Benet. You are welcome. I automatically connected with you. Even though I don't really make comments and stuff, I automatically connected with you because you're just like another Southern girl. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well since we're neighbors now and carowinds is like halfway between us maybe we I can know. meet up on a roller coaster someday that'd be fun yeah <laughs> i'll actually be there this week so if you want to go uh, ride some rides just oh just okay see. well i guess i need to go to work <laughs> oh oh yeah. yeah there's that there's that so. thank you Benet. i'll be all right thank you, thank you. all right bye